Well, good morning and welcome to Woodview's online service. This Sunday is Family Sunday here at Woodview, so we're going to have some special things happening this morning uh, just for uh, some of our younger audience there at home. Uh, so make sure they're there. Hopefully you're all wearing comfy pajamas, uh, staying warm and safe in your houses. Uh, really excited about some of the things that we're going to be doing this morning, so thank you so much for joining us and inviting us into your home. As we get started this morning, I just want to remind you of a couple important announcements. The first is to make sure that you're getting that on online bulletin. That'll get sent directly to your phone, or you can find this on Facebook. If you'd like to receive it, uh, you can text BLTN space WCC to 41411. Again, that's BLTN space WCC to 41411. That's just a really good way for you to make sure you're up to date on all the things that are happening here. It also gives you access to our Connect card, uh, which helps us, helps us out a whole lot uh, knowing who's watching from home. And uh, if there's anything, anything that you need us to be praying for, there's a place there for you to let us know that as well. Uh, but with everyone so distance, that will be a really great resource for you. So make sure you take a look at that. Uh, we want to call attention to one of the things that are, you will find in that digital bulletin. This year, we're going to be collecting money as part of our Christmas uh, offering uh, to donate to an organization to buy families uh, farm animals. Uh, there's a lot of, of, of villages and things all over the world uh, where things like chickens would completely change the lives of an entire village. And we would like to help provide those types of things for these villages. So for the next few weeks, you're going to be hearing more and more about what World Vision does in these villages and the way that we here in West Michigan can partner with them to not only improve their lives, but improve really the entire region and, and make sure that they have things like food and, and money and really a sustainable way of life. So stay tuned for more information about that over the next few weeks, but we're really excited uh, about what this all could mean for them and also for us here in West Michigan. With that said, we're going to kick things off this morning with a very, very special story read by our very own Kim Hannabon. Oh, hello. I'm so glad you came. Do you like stories? I love stories. In fact, I was just about to read a book. Would you like to join me? Okay, get all snuggly and sit down and put on your listening ears. Have you got them on? Okay. Today's book that we're going to read is called Pick a Pine Tree by Patricia Todd. Pick a pine tree from the lot. Slim and tall, or short and squat. One with spiky needle clumps, scaly bark, or sappy bumps. Long, straight limbs, or branches bent. Mmm, just smell that piney scent. Lift the tree above your head, bundle it upon your sled, or if you live very far, Bring it home atop your car. Now, move aside a lamp or chair. Clear away a section where your tree will sit tall and grand, snug and sturdy in its stand. Trim the trunk a little bit, just enough so it will fit. Slip it in and turn screws tight. They will hold your tree upright. Fill with water to the brink. Give your thirsty tree a drink. Then find the trimming stored within bulging boxes, rusty tins, paper bags, a wooden case. Bring them to that special place there beside your tree. But wait, don't decorate alone. Call some people on the phone. Ask your friends to come and stay. Host a decorating day. 
stretch along some twinkling lights, a colored mix, or simply white, fat round bulbs or pointy tips, bubble lights or candle clips. Start up top or near the base, wrap around and tuck in place. Next, hang ornaments upon your tree. What kind of trinkets will they be? Jolly Santas, dancing elves, wooden reindeer, jingle bells, lacy snowflakes, paper dolls, candy canes, and bright glass balls with loops of thread or wire hooks. Hang them all in little nooks. Add the final touches now. Garlands strung from bow to bow. Strands of tinsel on the tips, falling down in silver drips. Then grab a footstool, climb right up, set something wonderful on top. A golden star, a velvet bow, an angel dressed in flowing robes. Lay a tree skirt down below. Add some houses flecked with snow. A train that chugs around a track. Secret presents in a sack. At last it's time to make it shine. Plug in lights along the floor. Look. It's not a pine tree anymore. It's a Christmas tree. Gather round the tree to sing. Let your joyful voices ring. Celebrate as nighttime falls. Merry Christmas, one and all. Did you like that story? My grandparents had a nine foot tall Christmas tree with beautiful ornaments and garlands on it and an angel at the top that had real feathers. But my favorite part was the lights. Are you preparing to set up your Christmas tree? Oh, maybe you've already set your Christmas tree up, yes? Oh, this is such an exciting time of year. And it's very special too, because it's a time when we remember and we celebrate Jesus coming to earth as a baby. As you prepare to celebrate with those you love, I hope you have a wonderful time not just on the day, but during all the preparations for it. Thank you for coming, and you've been listening very, very well. Merry Christmas. Growing up, I can remember certain family traditions that always took place at our house the day after Thanksgiving. And I know many of you guys have a lot of those same traditions, and I would encourage you to talk about that real quick with your family. But I can remember at our house, one of the things that we would always do the day after Thanksgiving is all head out, we would bundle up, we would get on our boots, and we would drive off to the tree farm. Uh, now my family has a fake Christmas tree, and it seems to get put up earlier and earlier every year, but as a kid, we didn't really have the fake Christmas tree thing. Uh, so we would go out and we would cut our own, and I can just remember, like I can close my eyes and I can almost picture the place that we would go, and I could smell the hot chocolate and smell the dirt and the pine trees, and I can remember how muddy it always was. I don't know why it always seems so muddy, but it just was. And I can hear uh, my, my, my brother and, and sister and I finding a tree and, and, and wanting this tree and my dad arguing with us that it would never fit in our house and us arguing back and him finally giving up and cutting it down and later finding a way to make this thing that didn't fit in our house fit in our house. I can remember 
all of these traditions that we used to have growing up. Go ahead and write in the comments. I would love to hear from you. What are some of those family traditions that you can remember from when maybe when you were a child or some family traditions that you have in your family right now? No matter what your family traditions might be, uh, there's one thing that pretty much everybody can agree on. There's something about Christmas time that it's just special because of these things. Like very few people uh, can just do nothing until Christmas Day and all of a sudden just be ready for Christmas Day. Like for something, there is something about Christmas as a holiday that people just need to prepare for it. I mean, that was the story that we just got done reading just a moment ago, right? It was this family, and it was all of the things that they did to prepare for this holiday. And we are really no different. There are all types of things that we do to prepare for the holiday, and there are all types of things that it just doesn't feel like Christmas until this special thing happens. At our house, it's not Christmas until we watch Christmas Vacation. It doesn't matter when we watch it, that is officially the beginning of the Christmas season for us. We have to prepare for this holiday. And I think as we look into this new series, I just would like to ask us to think about why. Why do we feel this need to prepare for this holiday? Why does it feel like Christmas just keeps getting longer and longer and longer each and every year it comes around again. And I know that there's a whole thing that can be said about the consumerism and and how stores want to make money and all of these things, and I think that that's probably totally true. But I wonder if there's not more to that. I'm wondering if there's not more, especially from the Christian's perspective, about maybe maybe it just communicates how important this holiday really is to the life rhythm of the church and what it means for us as followers of Jesus to sit here and celebrate that moment in history where God moved in and did life with us regular people. So what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be starting a four-week series that I'm calling the Nativity Scene. And over the next four weeks, what I'd like to do is I'd like to take a look at this this birth narrative that we find in our Bibles, this story of the birth of Jesus, and I'd like to take a look at it from the different perspectives of different people in this story. Today, what we're going to be doing is we're going to kick this series off by looking at uh, two people that often don't get talked about when we talk about the life, uh, the birth of Jesus. We're going to talk about Elizabeth and Zechariah. So if you have a Bible, go ahead and open that, open, open that up uh, to Luke chapter 1, and we'll get reading about Elizabeth and Zechariah. Starting in verse 5. When Herod was the king of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah, and his wife Elizabeth was also from the priestly line of Aaron. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all the Lord's commandments and regulations. They also had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive, and they were both very old. Now I want to pause there, so keep your finger there, because we're going to be coming back to this off and on throughout the morning, but I just want to unpack a little bit about who these two people are, because they're not really a common feature in the other gospel accounts. Really, Luke is the only one that really gives them any attention like at all, but we learn quite a bit about them here in these first couple verses we learn that they both are from the priestly line of Aaron. So really what that means is they have very deep ties to the temple life. And you might be thinking to yourself, if you read through the book of Luke specifically, but really any of the Gospels, you know that Jesus would eventually come and there'd be some tension between Jesus and the religious order of Jesus' day. Because the temple in this point is very, uh, very corrupt, and it's very messy, and it's not really there doing the things that it's supposed to be doing. But right here in the beginning, Luke is separating these two 
people away from all of the corruption that is happening around them. Because what we learn here is that Zechariah, as a priest, is a very devout, God-honoring, righteous man. So that is really important for us to know. The second thing we learn here, which will become really important as the story progresses, um, is that they are unable to have children and that they are at a very old age. Now, we don't know exactly how old they are here. I've read some traditions put them, you know, somewhere between their 60s and their 90s, which is a very wide range. But the point of this is that they are past the age where they should be able to have children. But they don't have any yet. Now, this is really important, not just because of what's going to happen, but just because of what all of this means uh, for everything surrounding Elizabeth. Now, I've said this before in past sermons, but one of the things we need to keep in mind here is the idea that the Jewish nation, especially here in the first century, is a very superstitious culture. They had this belief that good things happened to those who earned good things and bad things happened to those who did bad things. It was more of a, a, a checks and balances, I do the good things, I get the good things, I do the bad things, I get the bad things type of uh, arrangement. So the fact here that we have this priest and his spouse, who's also from a priestly line, and the fact that they're not able to conceive would cast much shame on them as individuals. I can almost imagine the, the town square talk that might happen at their expense. I mean, did you hear about Elizabeth? Did you hear about Zechariah, that they can't have babies? I wonder what they did. I wonder the types of things that they are doing behind closed doors. Is Zechariah even a good priest? Like, is he doing things on the side? There's a lot of baggage here. And it can't go understated how, how, sh how, how, how shame would really cloud their entire existence. But let's keep reading. One day, Zechariah was serving God in the temple, for his order was on duty that week. As was the custom of the priest, he was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. While the incense was burning, was, bur was being burned, a great crowd out stood outside praying. And I want to pause again because we need to understand some things here. Luke does this thing uh, where he assumes his readers understand certain cultural uh, things. And one of those things right here is that the readers would know what the priests did and what their customs uh, were all about. But being here in the year 2020, it would be very doubtful that very many of you watching this this morning really would have a full understanding of exactly what the priests would do um, as part of their regular service to the temple. So let's unpack that a little bit because it's actually kind of important to what happens after this. The priests were typically split into different orders, and these different orders would take different shifts or week-long services to the temple. So they would essentially leave home for the entire week. They wouldn't go home at nighttime. They would just stay at the temple, and their entire focus was on temple-related tasks. They were there to greet people and do all of these priestly type of roles. But there was also this other thing that would happen. They would cast lots and one priest was allowed into an inner part of the sanctuary, inner part of the temple, to do a special act of lighting incense. Now, this is important for us to know because the priests who were chosen for this, you were usually only chosen one time in your entire life. This isn't something that Zechariah has ever done before. He's never been chosen. He's never been to this part of the temple before. And this would have been something that any priest would have been longing to do. This was your shot. This was your, your one chance to get in as close to the dwelling place of God as possible. This was a holy and very special moment for Zechariah. So I want you to keep that in mind with what happens next. Because while Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him, which 
makes sense. But the angel said, don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer, and your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son, and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or any other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth. He will, be, he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and he will cause those who are rebellious to adopt the wisdom of the godly. Zechariah said to the angel, How can I be sure that this will happen? I am an old man now, and my wife is also well along in years. Which I, as a, maybe it's a youth pastor in me, I just laugh at that, because that's the nice way of saying my wife is old. But that's just me. Then the angel said, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It is he who sent me to bring you this good news. But now, since, they, since you didn't believe what I said, you will be silent and unable to speak until the child is born. For my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah to come out of the sanctuary, wondering why he was taking so long. When he finally did come out, he couldn't speak to them. Then he realized... Then they realized from his gestures and his silence that he must have seen a vision in the sanctuary. When Zechariah's week of service to the temple was over, he returned home. Soon afterward, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and went into seclusion for five months. How kind the Lord is, she exclaimed. He has taken away my disgrace of not having children. So here we have this thing, and I, I find it kind of humorous when I read through this, almost like a dark comedy, because you have this moment where, where Zechariah, he's finally able to go into the temple to see this place that he's been longing for, this moment that he's been looking forward to his entire priestly career, and now we know he's at an old age, so his career is probably nearing its end, and he's finally got his shot at the big time. And out of nowhere, this angel just kind of appears and throws the whole thing out the window. Like, you have those things that you look forward to, right? And you kind of, you dream about how it's going to go, and this isn't what he had in mind. Like, at all. Instead, you have this angel of the Lord coming to this man and giving him the best news he's probably ever heard. I mean, we don't know what he's praying in that temple, but I can imagine having a son or not having a son is probably weighing pretty heavy on him at this moment. So you don't know if he's maybe praying about that or what he's praying for. But this angel shows up and he tells him not only is he going to have a son, but he's going to have a son that's going to help change the known world. Now, as a priest, as a priest, he would understand what was happening here. Because what this angel is essentially doing is he's calling attention uh, back to an Old Testament prophecy in the book of Malachi. Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, that talk about how before the Messiah comes, there's going to be this, this, this person who's going to come in and in the form of Elijah, and he's going to prepare the way for the Messiah. He's going to come and he's going to prepare people's hearts and, and, and get the ground ready for this Messiah who's going to come and change literally everything. So as this angel is talking to this priest, Zechariah, you have to know that those things are running through their heads. And I just love the response here because I can kind of relate to it. You're given this great, great news that this thing that you've been longing for your entire life is finally going to happen. This thing that has been bringing you and your wife so much shame for so long is finally going to be corrected. All the gossip that's happening about you around the town square can finally cease because Zechariah and Elizabeth finally are able to have their baby. 
there's an angel talking to you. And yet, Zechariah wants a sign. He wants proof. I can almost wonder if he's not worried that he's dreaming here. Like, I have to be dreaming. I've finally been picked to come into this place I've been wanting to be my entire life. I'm finally getting this good news that I've been waiting for my entire life. There's no way that any of this is really happening. I have to be sleeping. So I'm just going to ask for a sign just to make sure that this is real. Because if I'm going to invest myself in what this angel is saying, it has to be real because I'm not sure my heart can take another ounce of disappointment. Well, unfortunately for Zechariah, uh, this is where the dark comedy of it, I guess, pops in, for me anyway. He is silenced because of this, and he's not able to speak until his son John, who goes on to be known as John the Baptist, is born. And then there's this really kind of humorous scene where he comes out of the temple, and all these people have been outside praying, and they're waiting for him to come out, and they're beginning to wonder, like, what's going on in there? And he finally comes out, and he can't even tell them what has happened to him, so he starts miming it. This is like the ultimate game of charades. Like, how do you even go about miming, I just saw an angel, and he told me I'm going to have a baby? Like, I would love to see what that would look like. So those of you at home, I would love to see what that would look like. So film that and post that and tag Woodview in it, because I think that would be a really funny thing to see. Mime out what you think Zechariah did when he came out of that temple, because I think it'd be pretty humorous, personally. So he comes out of the temple, and then he finishes his week of service at the temple. He doesn't get to go straight home. The text says here he waits until after his week is over, and he goes home, and then it all happens. Elizabeth conceives. And she keeps it quiet, and she doesn't tell anyone for the first five months because, again, I can't help but feel like I can understand that. If I have at an old age, and I've been longing for this, and I've been shamed because of this, I'm not sure I want the cat out of the bag until I know it's all going to work out. So she doesn't even share it. So that is essentially the story of Elizabeth and Zechariah. And now that we've kind of familiarized ourselves a little bit with this story, I have to wonder, why does Luke, why does Luke start his gospel with this story? Because it's kind of a weird thing, right? Right? Like when you open up the Gospels, you're expecting to read about Jesus. And yet, for the first 25 verses of his book, he does this whole other story about this other guy who's kind of a side character in most of the other Gospels named John the Baptist. And he's not even there yet. It's about his parents who aren't even mentioned in any of the other Gospels. Why does, John, or why does Luke start his Gospel like this. I mean, really, if you look at it, the whole first chapter of Luke, Jesus' name is only mentioned one time, and that's not even until like verse 30-something. Like, why does he start things this way? I think it has a lot to do with how important it is that his readers are, are prepared for the coming Messiah. Because there are just some things that happen that we have to prepare for if we're we're really going to be able to fully enjoy what's about to happen. Just like our Christmas celebrations, we spend an entire month preparing ourselves for one day of celebrating with family, with friends, you know, all the presents, you know, all of these things. We spend an entire month decorating and buying stuff and cooking and and doing all of these little things leading up to this one holiday because it just doesn't feel like Christmas unless we're prepared for Christmas. The same thing is, I think, happening here. Luke is preparing 
his readers for something that is about to happen, that is about to change everything. And I think you need to remember an important couple details because we have this luxury here in the, the 2000s that we live in today where we, uh, we're able to experience the entire history of all the Jewish history all in one time in one book. So we can flip from Malachi, the last book in your Old Testament, to, to Matthew in our New Testaments in about 30 seconds. But what we need to know as we prepare for this season is that that gap takes about 400 years. There's a 400-year gap where God isn't absent. He's still there with his people, but for some reason he just isn't as boisterous. He's not as present as he was before. And you have 400 years worth of these people waiting for something, for anything to happen. You've got these people who are under the, the thumb of Rome and they're just wanting life back. They're wanting life to improve. And they're all thirsty and they're hungry for God to do something in their lives. They're all thirsty for the presence of God. And what Luke is about to get into here is that this presence of God, this presence of God that these people have become so hungry for, so desperate for, these, this presence of God that maybe even some are wondering if it's even ever going to actually happen. Much like Elizabeth and Zechariah, are they ever going to have kids? They're old. There's no way they're going to have kids anymore. They've probably completely even given up on hope. And I imagine there's a lot of Jews living in this first century world who have completely given up on any type of hope that they would ever be able to see any of the promises of God fulfilled in their lifetime. And yet, Luke is about to unfold this, this story of this Messiah who's decided to come here, live his life, although he is God, he chooses to live his life as a human being here amongst all of the regular people. These people who have been so thirsty and hungry for the presence of God are about to be blasted by the fire hose that is the real presence of God as the presence of God lives amongst them. And it's going to be John the Baptist's job, his role to play, that he will spend his entire life playing this role of preparing people to be able to receive this presence of God when he comes walking into their town. So that's why I think Luke decides to start his gospel here talking about the birth of John the Baptist and not the birth of Jesus right away because there's something important about preparing ourselves for this thing that we are longing for. And for us here 2,000 years later, I think that there's an important message here for us as well because what we see here is this page that is turned in the history of the Jewish world, but the history of time as we know it, where even when the world is at its darkest, even when things are at its ho most hopeless, it is in those moments where the presence of God shines the brightest. Even though Zechariah, even though Elizabeth had given up on their ability to ever have kids, even though they have resigned themselves to living a life of shame and just kind of fading away into the grave when their time came, it's in that hopeless moment that this angel of the Lord shows up and gives them the hope of descendants the hope of not just any son, but a son that Jesus would later go on to say there has been no greater person ever born than this man, John the Baptist. For the Son of God to say that about you, I would say that'd be a pretty high honor. There's hope in these hopeless moments. The history of the Jewish nation waiting for this Messiah to come, it's never been darker and yet, 
this is when God shows up. This is when the presence of God is born here on this earth. So how about us? How about you? Where in your life are you needing to feel the presence of God? Is there a moment or is there something in your life right now that you just feel is completely hopeless? It's my prayer that this Christmas season, as you prepare to celebrate the coming Messiah, that you can turn those things over. Turn those things over to this God who cares so much for us and allow his presence into those moments in our lives where we feel like things are at its bleakest, where things are at their most hopeless. Because I think when you invite him into those hurts, those dark areas, he's there to shine his light. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for uh, showing up in the midst of our darkness, for showing up when life seems absolutely hopeless. Lord, it's my prayer that this Christmas season that we can begin to see your presence, that we can begin to feel your warmth, that we can begin to see your light. Lord, be with us throughout these next couple weeks and prepare us. Prepare us to receive your Son. Prepare us. Prepare us to take after John the Baptist and make a life uh, of showing and pointing others in your direction. Lord, it's your name we pray. Amen.
want to thank you so much for joining us this morning. Here in a moment, we're going to be celebrating communion. Uh, so we encourage you to take a moment and go and find whatever elements that you can find laying around your house. Uh, it just needs to be something to eat, something to drink, uh, anything that can help you remember and celebrate the body that was broken for you and the blood that was spilled for you on the cross. And while you're doing that, I just want to also make sure to mention that um, it's important one of the important things uh, about belonging to a church and, and, and uh, partnering together with your fellow believers in this mission uh, to, to bring peace to the world involves uh, a giving of tithes and offerings. This is something that the Bible talks about in several places. Uh, so one of the things I want to make sure we include this morning is just a reminder that even though we're not able to come here and drop our money in a plate on our way out, there are other ways for us to give as well. One of those ways is by finding our website and clicking the Give tab at the top. You can also just mail your tithes and offerings to the church office uh, at your convenience. This is really just those of you that are regular attenders of our church and consider this to be your church home. There is no pressure whatsoever towards any of you that are just kind of feeling us out or, or just watching uh, just to see what this whole thing is and who Woodview is and all of those things. Uh, but if you are a regular attender, I just want to remind you to take advantage of this time to also go ahead and give your offerings. the herald angel sings. That is such a classic Christmas carol. It's one of those Christmas carols that it just doesn't feel like Christmas until you sang that song at least once. Um, and, I, and I really, really love how that song goes. But one of the things I, I think is kind of funny about that song is um, no one talks like that. Like, I'm not texting my buddies during the football game on Sunday like, hark, the bears are terrible. Like, that's not a, really a way any of us really speak. And I'm curious if maybe the meaning of some of the things in that song might have been lost because of how weird some of the language are, 
might be. I think a better way for us to think about Hark the Herald Angel Sings would be to really modernize it by saying, hey, listen, the messenger angels have announced glory to the baby king. Like, that is really what this song is about. It's about this message that is being proclaimed and shared and spread. I mean, it really, it seems kind of fitting that we talked about the birth of John the Baptist this morning because that really is John's whole bag. That is his entire life. It's him sharing this message that this baby was born and that his baby was about to change the entire known world. And one of the lines in that song that I really have always loved is that line that says this, Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Now again, that's kind of a weird way to talk about it, but I want us, especially as we come time for our communion here in a moment, uh, to think about it like this. Essentially what this song is doing is it is telling, it is sharing this message that this baby, this baby isn't going to stay a baby. This baby is going to grow up. This baby is going to do things here on this earth, like heal people and bring actual physical mercy to people who desperately need it, and that this baby would eventually grow up to become a man who would be arrested even though he had done no crime, and that this man would eventually be hung on a cross and crucified, that this baby would eventually die And by doing so, he would reconcile, which is really just a fancy way of saying fix the relationship between God and man. And as we take communion, I just think that there's no real better way for us to frame our thinking as we prepare to take those elements. Because what we're doing is we're celebrating this baby who doesn't stay a baby. We're celebrating this baby who grows up to die for us. And by doing so, brings peace and mercy and reconciliation. By dying, this baby fixes a broken relationship, giving each and every person who chooses, who chooses to to refer to this baby as their king, life. So as you take your elements, I would, pr- I would just ask that you prayerfully uh, meditate on that reality. That you would prayerfully meditate uh, on this baby who would come to bring peace and mercy and reconciliation through his eventual death on the cross.
Well, thanks again for joining us on our Family Sunday. We hope that you all are doing well. You had a great Thanksgiving last week. Uh, we look forward to connecting with you, so make sure you drop some comments. Let us know that you're watching. Uh, and if there's anything that we can be praying for, make sure to fill out those Connect cards and let us know. Uh, we love you. We miss you. We wish you were here. Uh, hopefully, that'll be something we can do here uh, before you know it. Hope you all have a great week.